Good morning. <laughs> is there anybody here from, or are there any high school students here, or is it all college? How many? That's what I thought. Okay. What high school are you guys with? Hey. Um, I love coming to North Dakota. It's become, for me, almost an adopted state. Um, part of it is I had asthma as a kid, and I think for some reason the Great Plains, the landscape here, always appeals to me, the sense of openness. I get a little bit claustrophobic places, so the um, just driving here sort of um, uh, triggers a kind of freedom mechanism. I know you guys in high school here, you many ways you always, I grew up in Perrysburg, Ohio. I always wanted to get out of Perrysburg. I know a lot of people sometimes want to get out of their hometown and get out there in the world, but there, you live in a very special place. This is a very special university. Um, I was telling the president of the school that two of the great American authors have commented on just where we're at right now. One was Jack Kerouac in his On the Road journals. Has anybody read On the Road by Jack Kerouac? Well, if you, you should read it. It's a, a great American novel, but he's talked about the people of Dickinson. I edited a book of Kerouac's journals called Windblown World, and he said there are no finer people than in Dickinson, North Dakota. And he talked about seeing a bus stuck in the snow, how all the people pulled together to get the bus out. And it's a beautiful homage. And it, at the end of it, he said that he wants to be buried in Medora, North Dakota. He's instead Kerouac, buried in Lowell, Massachusetts, where he grew up. And also the great Erskine Caldwell, uh, author of Tobacco Road, had, um, had wrote about being here at Dickinson, actually coming to Dickinson State University. And uh, he's, the, Tobacco Road was the best-selling novel of the 1930s, sort of one of the 20th century classics. So these two major authors have all commented on life in Dickinson. Before I talk, I want to ask a friend of mine to stand up. Uh, she's somebody I love a great deal. I've adopted her as a surrogate mother. Um, she's a person who's been an impresario, along with her late husband, Harold Schaefer of Medora, and creating this sort of essence there in Medora of, of the, the western frontier of the Badlands that Theodore Roosevelt saw no finer national park, and I go to all of them, than what happens at Theodore Roosevelt National Park between both units and the power of the Badlands and the fact that tourists could come and see buffalo, see prairie dogs, see antelope. And the person that I think is responsible for keeping the spirit of Western Dakota, Northwestern North Dakota, alive is Shiloh Schaefer. And would you stand just for one minute, Shiloh? Thank you. I don't want to get into, it's an endless proposition to, um, to start naming people and then you end up leave, leaving people out. But my colleagues that are here, um, um, many of them have just written um, um, Candace and Patricia, fabulous books on Theodore Roosevelt that are just getting rave reviews everywhere. And I know some of you can't keep up on the literature of this. Some of you have never read a book on Theodore Roosevelt. But we're walking in, in uh, high cotton, as they say. We have really outstanding um, Roosevelt scholars here in Tweed Roosevelt just to connect to the family and to hear his adventures and he knows so much about the personal TR it never ceases to um, impress me and he's just one of those good guys that once you know him in your life he stays in your life and Clay thank you I know how much work you do and what you're bringing to here Clay's a Rhodes scholar um, somebody who could be anywhere he chose to come back to North Dakota and he's sort of become the in many ways, the conscience of the Little Missouri River, and somebody who works to keep people like Jefferson and TR's image alive around the country, and I'm grateful for that. Look, I wanted to talk today about conservation and Theodore Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt as naturalist. We heard a lot about blood sport. We heard a lot about hunting. I know there are hunters here. It's a big part of Theodore Roosevelt's conservation. And it intertwines hunting and conservation with groups like the Boone and Crockett Club in his life. But the beginning of TR's saga, and it makes some of you guys wonder if you're, you're keeping diaries or journals, just imagine Theodore Roosevelt was eight years old and he already started keeping 
an account of his life and his but mainly his naturalist life. At eight years old, he went down to a war front in New York and got a head of a seal, a skull. He saw the full seal, dead seal, laying there at a fish market. He'd come back and as a little kid was mesmerized uh, by seeing an animal like that that somebody had just brought out of the water. He'd go back every day. He kind of wanted the seal. Eventually, he negotiated to get the skull. And that became the beginning of Theodore Roosevelt's own natural history museum that the young TR um, started collecting animals and, and bird's nest, eggs, um, skeletons of any kind of animal possible. And he would do detailed study and recording on this starting at eight years old. The late John Gable used to always tell me TR's first writing was about birds at eight, and then he wrote about birds on his deathbed. This was a man who didn't just like nature, he dedicated life to conservation, and he was our great naturalist president. Now, the journey uh, we have to ask is, why is a kid at eight years old collecting all these things all children like animals. All you have to do is look at Disney or, or any cartoon network and you can see how kids are attracted to anything dealing with animals. But Roosevelt had two unique role models in his life early on which gave him an advantage, a head naturalist. First was his father who created the Museum of Natural History in New York. If you guys go to New York, you see the great, our country's great natural history museum. Roosevelt's father created in their in their parlor in Manhattan were the first meetings to create this. So you talk about an enduring gift to the United States from the Roosevelt family. This this natural history museum it, it, it's par excellence. There's nothing remotely like it. But his father was in some ways a very prudish, puritanical um, philanthropist. He was not somebody known to have a wild streak. He was a dedicated and devoted family man. He was a man about integrity and about honesty. Somebody asked me about American presidents, which I wrote, write about. The one thing I'll tell you, you learn about TR is he always told the truth. You don't find Roosevelt lying. And that's the number one lesson of him as president. Always call it. Um, and you don't go wrong in, in history. He's a role model in that regard. He made mistakes. In many ways, we can frown on Theodore Roosevelt, aspects of his imperialism. Um, by today's standards, there's a racism in some aspects of what TR was about. But, but nobody can ever challenge his bedrock honesty and, and courage of his convictions. Now, the other side beyond his father is a lesser known figure, and that's his father's brother, his uncle, Uncle Rob Roosevelt. Robert Roosevelt was a grand eccentric of mid-19th century America. At the time of the Civil War and shortly after, Uncle Rob was considered the Audubon of America. He wrote books about fish um, in, in New England. He wrote about uh, Canada. He was uh, an expert on, on fish and birds. Now remember, if you cut to America in the 1870s, the, the Roosevelt's love of natural history, is they're not operating in a bubble. We know that Thomas Jefferson was a great naturalist. Um, there was, a, um, there was a, a course Audubon, and I hope you all know when you see those Audubon bird illustrations, Audubon would actually kill the, the game. He'd shoot the bird, do taxidermy, get it stuffed, and then draw it from the stuffed um, and, but there's this tradition of Audubon, and Uncle Rob is part of it. Robert Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's uncle, created the first fish hatchery in the United States. He ran for Congress, served at one term with one idea in mind, and that was to repopulate the Hudson River of, with shad, the fish that had been, been killed off from overfishing. So if today you see people with Save the Whale... With Uncle Rob, it was Save the Shad in New York. 